Hello, my name is Leslie Verner, and on behalf of Carolina Breast Friends, we are very excited to have all of you with us today. We have an excellent program planned for you, and it's an honor to have our speaker with us. Her name is Dr. Lupa Mudra Dasroy, and she has more than 18 years of experience in research, teaching, and mentoring of undergraduate and PhD students in the fields of genetics and breast cancer. She received her PhD in molecular biology and genetics from the Mayo Clinic. She has been a principal investigator at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and she received grants from the National Cancer Institute. She is a well-known speaker at international conferences and she has established an international network of breast cancer resources. She's also done extensive research in male breast cancer. So we are honored to have Dr. Das Roy with us today, and I will turn the program over to her. Thank you so much, Leslie, and uh, thanks to each of you here who have given your time to listen to me. It's a privilege and honor for me. And thank you, Carolina Breast Friends and the Pink House. And once COVID is over, I would love to come and meet you all. So before that I start, can you all hear me clear? Thumbs up for if you can hear me clearly. Yes. Okay, so the volume is all clear, clear. right? Perfect. So Leslie, uh, can I share the screen now? You know, thank you so much, Leslie, again for the generous introduction. Just a correction, I did my PhD from India and I, in genetics and molecular biology, and I did my postdoctoral fellowship from Mayo Clinic School of Medicine on breast and pancreatic cancer. So my, um, so that's where my full uh, transformation to cancer happened in my in my career. Now, um, you know, like. Um, the reason why inflammation and cancer is so close to my heart because I have done extensive research on this and any time after the session, also if you would like to connect with me, all the information will be there. I'm all the time I'm here to help. And uh, to start with, I want to start with a small story, you know, like um, as Leslie has mentioned, I have done work on arthritis. So one of my uh, subset of work is on arthritis and breast cancer too. And we all know that arthritis is a type of inflammation. So the story goes like when we discovered the mechanism. Yes, that, yes sorry, you can't hear. You can hear okay so when when you uh, when uh, the story like with the relationship between arthritis and breast cancer when we discovered the link at that time like we had the press release in american association of cancer research in 2012 and when i went for the session after my talk one of the breast cancer survivors she comes up to me and tells me that you know like i'm so now i know why my friend and I, we both had breast cancer, the same stage, but why her cancer progressed so fast. So that's the role and I, I was so touched at that time because I felt that wish she knew, because that was the term that her friend mentioned, that wish we knew about this. And that's why my goal has been to spread the word about the role of inflammation and how small steps can redefine it, you know, help with the prognosis too. So, um, I mean, I know you all are familiar with the term and, uh, you know, like, of course, inflammation too, but inflammation, like metastasis, we all think like metastasis is always regulated by the intrinsic genetic changes, right? But the microenvironment plays a huge role with the progression, with the, with the metastasis, and then inflammation plays a part too. Now, when we think of inflammation, we think of like, it's to help us, it's to repair. Like, you know, because when we get a cut in the skin, we see the swelling, we see the inflammation in here, and that's where our cut is being healed. And that's why I always say inflammation has dual role. One is for protection against the, any infection, but when inflammation goes out of control, then it can definitely damage the body. So inflammation plays a role 
with the establishment, with the progression, with the migration of the tumor cells. And if you see this picture here, so I'm going to speak today in very layman terms so that when you walk out of the room, you will be able to explain to others and you can spread the word. That is my goal. Now here, we, if you see with the tumor development, because, you know, like um, I had a discussion with Leslie and she mentioned that, you know, like everyone is aware of the cancer scenario here. So I'm going to talk about the ways I can help with your cancer scenario. Now, when we think of tumor development, right? So you see here, there are, um, do you see my arrow moving? Um, okay, perfect. Now, inflammation, when we think of inflammation, few things come to our mind is just the autoimmune disease. Like we can only think of arthritis, we can think of lupus, we can think of other inflammatory diseases. But we, never, we should not forget other factors too, which can cause the rise of inflammation. That can be therapy-induced inflammation, tumor-associated inflammation, and also inflammation caused by environment and also the dietary factors. And that's what we are going to talk about today. Now, before going into the other key risk factors that cause inflammation, I want to talk a little bit about our work on arthritis and breast cancer. Now, we found the link, we discovered the molecular mechanism, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I want you to understand that arthritis is, of course, a type of, like rheumatoid arthritis is a type of chronic inflammation. And what happens is that with breast cancer, we all know that the favorite place the cancer cells try to migrate with breast cancer is the bones. So just understand the situation here. Now, cancer cells love to travel breast cancer cells to the bones. If in the bone itself, there is so much of inflammation, it gives a conducive environment to the bone for the tumor cells to travel faster. So from our data, like I have worked on breast cancer and arthritis for five years, and we published like, I think three, four papers from there. And we've constantly found that when there's inflammation in the bones and also not only bone, because when we think of arthritis, we are thinking that, okay, only our bones, our fingers are inflamed, our joints are swelled. But we are forgetting that there are so many pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body that is upregulated. So it's not only about the bones, the whole body system is being triggered here. So that's where we need to control. And this picture that you see is from one of our publications where I'm showing here that you see this is the bone and this is the lungs. And for example, this is our breast cancer cells and when they are traveling through the bloodstream, the lungs and the bones, they are very prone to like huge in inflammation, the target organs, so they can easily switch and jump from the bloodstream to the lungs and the bones. So that's how the travel is faster. Now we did not stop there. So we had to find out what is actually going on. So we looked into the different pro-inflammatory markers and we found that, for example, interleukin-6, IL-17, TNF-alpha, VEGF, molecular uh, macrophage colony stimulating factors, these are different <laughs> inflammatory cytokines which are also upregulated. So interestingly, with breast cancer, already these cytokines are upregulated in a natural condition because the tumors create all the inflammation to be triggered anyways. Now just imagine when we are having arthritis, these are much higher and that's why it creates this environment. So when we found that, we went deeper. So that's when we found that mast cells, which actually is a regulator, which kind of like um, is always needed for repair and everything, this is high in the tumor cells and also in circulation and muscles have a receptor, you see here, this is a muscle with a receptor, which we call a C-kit receptor, and the tumor cells, they have, here, these are the tumor cells, and if you see the red over here on the tumor cells, which is known as a factor called SCF, 
stem cell factor. So what we discovered was that with the tumor, the breast cancer cells, the malignant cells will have this factor on the surface. And when the body with cause of arthritis is having so much of mast cell, when it is traveling, it's kind of lock and key mechanism. So the mast cells are, because of the secret receptor, is attracting the stem cell factor on the cancer cells to come and sit there. So that is the mechanism that kind of helped us to understand that with breast cancer and arthritis, the progression, the metastasis is significantly higher as compared to the non-arthritic condition. And the reason why I'm saying this is, it's not that, you know, we, we just have to be careful because when, when you go to your doctor, talk about this. That is why I'm bringing this up because this is, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. I want you to understand that if you're having any other chronic diseases inside your body, we need to talk to the oncologist and tell them that it's not only the cancer we need to target, we also have to target the inflammatory situation because it's all interrelated. So when we target the inflammation, automatically the cytokines, the regulators, which are helping in the tumor progression will be downregulated. And that will help in reducing, in stopping the progression for cancer. So that is very important for us to understand. And I'm trying to explain in a simple way, and this will really help. So just speak up, it's your own body. We just have to bring it out to the oncologist that we need to target inflammation equally as we are targeting cancer when we are diagnosed. Now, now I'm going to also talk about the other key risk factors leading to inflammation. And these are very simple things, you know, and which can be easily targeted. First thing I want, would definitely, I'm not in favor of smoking because smoking, tobacco, and uh, you know, like it's not only, we, when we think of smoking, we are just thinking like, okay, we are prone to lung cancer. That's not the case. Smoking, the tobacco, when it goes in our body, it's going in our bloodstream and all the susceptible tissues are also prone to, you know, become mutated. That's why it's definitely not a good thing. If we are smoking, we definitely need to quit smoking to decrease the risk of developing cancer or decrease the progression of cancer for sure. Now, what happens is that when the smoking actually, it causes the visceral damage in different tissues, right? And that point, the inflammatory factors will come into play. And that's how smoking is getting linked to inflammation. Same scenario is with alcohol. Now, I'm not saying that you stop alcohol because definitely it's not like as harmful as smoking, but alcohol also has been seen that too much consumption is causing a lot of damage in the internal organs, like the tissues in the intestine. And at that point, also like it damages the other organs too, and that together will cause a conducive inflammatory reaction and which kind of pain is related to inflammation, which we are trying to bring it down with any kind of diseases when we have it in parallel. Now I'll talk about diet, stress and exercise afterwards, but I want to bring into attention of other things too. For example, obesity. Now obesity, weight control is definitely a request to everyone. We, de we really need to keep a check on the weight because weight obesity causes low grade inflammation in the body. And then it also, what it does is it also goes and uh, manipulates the insulin secretion in the body. So it kind of like affects with the diabetes effects with other, you know, like in other conditions, other chronic diseases in the body. So it's all interrelated. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, when we also think of radiation, like when we go through, you know, with, after chemotherapy, we go through radiation and then with the radiation, the tissues in the breasts are getting damaged, right? Because we are trying to 
skill that we are trying to um, kind of take off all the remnant uh, tissues, cancer cells in our breast. Now, when we are doing there, so we are damaging the tissues. At that time also, there is an inflammatory response going on there. So that's how even during the cancer treatment, there may be some, because of treatment, some inflammatory reactions going on, which we definitely have to target. And we are going to discuss about that. But I wanted to bring into limelight the factors that can cause inflammation within our body that we may not even know of. And definitely environment is one of the major factors. Now, when we think of environment, we also think of, you know, like um, water, we think of the workplace, we think of so many factors. But do we, how many of us over here know the situation of Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, who is a very, our neighbor, like, please, uh, if you can give a thumbs up, if you know about Camp Lejeune disaster, which happened because of, uh, you know, the toxin in the water in the base of the Camp Lejeune. Okay, so I don't see thumbs up like, um, so that means we, okay, perfect. I see one thumbs, yeah, okay. So this is a very sad scenario that happened, like which is, um, I mean, a marine, this is a Marine Corps base, which is 70 miles north of Wilmington. And uh, you know how I got to know about this? That's, and, and, the, and the contaminants were tank full of chemicals, including dioxin, arsenic, and more of that. It was, there was a leakage into the ground that seeped into wells, which people drank from over oh, more than 35 years, causing the disease and also more into the breast cancer in male and also different type of cancer. Now, here, if you see my screen clearly, you can, um, you can see that here is Mike Pertain. And I don't know if you know Mike Pertain. So last year when I was at Male Breast Cancer Coalition Conference, I heard him talk over there. So he, is, um, he was diagnosed a stage through two breast cancer and, he, and the cancer, he got the cancer because of the Camp Lejeune disaster. And like him, there were so many men who came up afterwards mentioning they came in the news and because of this camp, uh, you know, the disaster, because of the contaminant that was in the water they were drinking. The reason why I'm saying this is we have to be very aware. When we are going through cancer, we have to be so careful with what we are eating, what we are drinking, our environment, and we just have to be cautious because all this whatever I'm talking about, this will create an inflammatory reaction in the body. And sometimes these are by themselves carcinogen. So this will help in the progression. This will help in the recurrence or even those who are not going through cancer, we are at so high risk. So these factors are very important for us to understand. Now, in my, uh, in my knowledge, one thing that I feel is very critical and which is a master regulator for inflammatory reactions in the body and which helps in the upregulation of oncogenic signaling is the stress. Stress, I know that like, it's not easy to overcome stress when we are diagnosed with cancer also it's not easy or in our day-to-day -day life, you know, any family member or when we go through all the environmental different situations in life, but stress kind of is not only bad for cancer, but for other diseases too. Because when stress becomes chronic, it can lead to the tissue breakdown and impairment of the immune system. And when our immune system is becoming weak, we are susceptible to more infections, to more different kinds of diseases to be surrounded by us. And these are the different signs of uh, stress that I have mentioned. But when I think of stress reliever, like for example, I myself, I don't get much time to do, you know, like, and I know I'm in stress all the time too, because, but what I think is what makes us happy? You know, just do that. If you love to dance, just dance. If you love to do yoga, do yoga, do meditation, be with friends, be happy, be with family. That is what I feel is a biggest stress reliever. Do what you love to do. Take out time for yourself. You know, because this is the precious time. And one thing I always tell everyone, like, don't be sad. You know, I have met so many cancer advocates and who tell me that, you know, Lopa, I became so much stronger 
after the diagnosis. And I tell them that cancer can be cured, but think about other diseases like, you know, like chronic kidney disease, heart disease. It's like a prolonged thing. My dad passed away from chronic kidney disease in February. That's why I couldn't come for the session in person session. And that's when I realized that with, you know, like there are so many factors in life and which are stress regulated, which we can improve if we, you know, like try to curtail it. Now I'm going to talk about a very important topic, which will help us so much, which is the diet. As I said, like um, in the previous slide, stress will be helped if we do some kind of exercise. The reason why I mentioned exercise is that exercise helps in boosting the immune system. So when you're doing exercise, don't think that it's like a daily routine for you. Enjoy and do that. That will really help. And that will definitely slow down the inflammation in your body. So these were the different factors that you can bring down inflammation, but diet plays a very, very important role. Now, when I talk about diet, I want to speak something like in a scientific way so that you know why we always talk about antioxidants. Because sometimes it becomes difficult for our own, like for me, sometimes my kids will ask me the question, why are you stopping us to eat junk food? You know, but then so we have to explain it to them on the ground level. So what happens is that in our body, the tumor cell, the cells, like the good cells are constantly going through lots of changes, lot of mutations. And there is always a DNA repair mechanism which is helping the cells to be repaired. You know, the DNA which is causing, like any change in the DNA will cause in the abnormality in the cell uh, multiplication, right? So, but if the DNA repair mechanism is constantly on, then it will definitely, you know, help with the repair. But sometimes our body and who is one of the main factors of the cell damage is free radicals. That's what I want to show you. So these are the free radicals and these free radicals, this is the free radical. What it does is that it will go and const it is constantly being formed in our body and it will go and try to damage the DNA. But inside our body, there are antioxidants which will help to clean up the free radicals. But what happens is that our body gets exhausted. And that's when we need to help our body from outside, give them good food from outside and not the junk food. So because the junk, the, the food which are not healthy, this will create more generation of free radicals rather than antioxidants to protect our cells. So this is in simple word, you know, like this is the free radical, the antioxidant is going to give one of its part to this to balance it so that this free radical is now not available to go and damage the cell. And that is why who can provide these free radicals from exogenously are the antioxidant rich food. And I'm going to share this slides, but uh, um, definitely like these are very important and you can keep them with you. Now, what are the food? Now, antioxidants also help in curtailing the inflammation. And that's where everything is interconnected. Some of the, I'm not in favor of the processed food. I'm not in favor of like, uh, you know, um, I would say like, um, I mean, I, I eat non-veg, but I'm just saying that like we can control, you know? So, and it's not necessary that, um, uh, like all the time, the vegetables itself will be all the time healthy because we have to know what food, what vegetables also we are eating. I'll give an example. I just want to check the time. Yeah, I'll give an example of my own life, you know. So I had seven miscarriages. So doctors gave up all hope and doctors told me I was on the, I had, um, I was on the verge of adoption and um, this was like uh, in 2009. So after um, I had seven miscarriages, doctors said that, no, you cannot carry your pregnancy. It's impossible because I have so many blood clotting mutations in my body. So I know that I have, so when I got to know that I have the mutations in my body, what I did was and then when I gave up all hope, I stopped all the treatments because I knew this is not going to work. I don't know, by God's grace, 
I conceived naturally. So when I did that, I kind of tried to figure out like what is my problem in my body? And I know it's the blood clotting problems. So what I did was I went and I still remember that day I was going to the university, you know, and I packed my lunch, my husband packed when he got to know I'm pregnant again, the eighth time. And uh, he uh, packed like all green vegetables. Like it was like spinach, you know how healthy spinach is, right? For everyone, like spinach and uh, broccoli and uh, all of that. So when I went to the lab, for some reason, now I knew what was wrong with my body. So immediately I felt that, let me see if there is a natural diet, which is going to be what if, because I was an aspirin from that, like before that, because I have all these mutations. Now, I tried to look up and do some research and I found that the food that I got, which is um, at spinach, is all rich in vitamin K. And vitamin K is a natural coagulant in the body. And I was taking aspirin, which is a natural anticoagulant. So immediately I realized that this is going to cross react with what I'm taking. So I'm taking aspirin. My aspirin will not work if I'm taking such high vitamin K rich diet because it's going to counteract with my, with my, uh, with my medicine. So that's when I made my own diet I had like rich in vitamin E, which is a natural blood thinner. And you cannot believe 10 year, months I sustained my pregnancy. And doctors tell me like, how, how do you, so, and then I, I just want to tell you this because it's so important that like I feel like now I'm brave to share my story, which I wasn't before because it's all related. So after three months, when I went again for my checkup, like I've been consistently going, the doctor said, you have to stop aspirin now because if you are not stopping it, then the baby, the contraction, you may miscarry. My question was, how will I sustain my pregnancy 10 months if I'm stopping my anticoagulant medicine? So make your own judgment. Doctor said, okay, you carry on, do it, you know, and I sustain. So the reason I'm saying is diet is like miracle. We should not underestimate it. You know, every day diet, and I have two boys now, my second kid also, same day I sustained. And um, that's where I, the faith comes in me. And that's why with confidence, I can talk to you about it. And um, coming back to the slide, the best anti-inflammatory, I would say is turmeric. You know, turmeric's byproduct is curcumin. Now, curcumin is something that in our research, what we started to do was add curcumin as an additive to the treatment when we are writing the proposals. I'm not saying that I'm not in favor of Ayurveda or any medications which are supplemental. Don't take any medications which you think like, you know, now, because I have seen a lot of patients taking a lot of Ayurvedic medications along with the cancer treatment. We should not do that because we want the cancer cells to die when we are going through the chemotherapy, not to protect the cancer cells. So it's very important for us to understand this fact. So, but we can follow this particular diet, which are naturally anti-inflammatory in our body, but not have any external medications like capsules to bring down the inflammation, bring up the antioxidants because we want our treatment to work. Once the treatment is over, you can go back to your regime that you planned ahead. Now, when we come to turmeric, I would always suggest that not to buy the powdered turmeric from the market, but to buy the raw roots of the turmeric, which you will get in any Indian store or any stores all across. Because nowadays they have curcumin as a tablet also, which is found in all medical stores. But still, I would say, when you're going through any treatment, go for the natural products rather than the supplementals, which are available for that particular duration of time. Fresh ginger, fresh onions, these are all and highly anti-inflammatory. Garlic, garlic is so good. With, it builds up the immune system like anything which you need with the treatment. Now, foods that other food that fight inflammation are, for example, tomatoes, 
berries, nuts, olive oil, leafy greens, fatty fish, like food rich with omega-3. So that I would definitely be in favor. And, um, you know, like one thing I would say, like people say berries are magic. Right, so berries are very good for health, but always also be careful that I'm always little worried because these are not like I I am more into like a uh, like a pineapple which has a huge skin that you can cut it off because when we are having all different type of berries, please make sure that is washed properly because you do not want the pesticides or any other properties that nowadays in the market, that's why organic is always better. So, there, so, you know, so, so that's where you have to be very conscious about the food that you're eating from where it is coming also. Because a lot of time, many um, advocates told me that Lopa, I have done everything right, but still you know why I'm having the disease. And I really have no answer. But there is something called genetics, which I will talk about later. And there's something called environmental factors. There are so many things going on in our body, but we have to try our best. That is what I tell everyone. These are natural anti-inflammatory food, and I'll send it to you all. One thing I say, like, you know, pepper, peppers have capsin, which is a high anti-inflammatory. So, you know, um, if you have noticed that in the arthritis ointment, they have capsin as an ingredient there, and that comes from red paper. So this way, all these natural products are rich in phytochemicals, like wheat is high in phytochemicals, and phytochemicals, rich product, rich vegetables and fruits are also very good for the estrogen positive breast cancer patients. Because uh, in our support group, uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the advocates who is a estrogen positive, she once asked me, and then this was the phytochemical rich food that I told her, but I also told her, don't stop your medications, that you have to take. So don't be solely dependent on the natural food. Definitely you have to complete your therapy, your traditional um, treatment that was, that was given by your oncologist, but this, in this on the side will definitely help. Now, foods that cause free radicals and trigger inflammation, here is the list. And I know that everyone loves this kind of food, like sugar. I would always say that sugar, there's a lot of controversy and research going on about sugar. A lot of people say like sugar doesn't help, I mean, doesn't trigger cancer progression, but I would always say that let's reduce it because in no way sugar than the saturated food, the processed uh, flour which, which, by which we make the cake, muffin, sometimes it's good, but even if you're having it, just reduce the amount of it, you know, so that will be helpful. And I'm not saying because we don't want to curtail everything. We should enjoy everything, but in a limited manner. But this is the list I would request everyone, fried food, soda, refined carbs, you know, like all of this uh, um, to just a request. I mean, I know it's not easy, but I'm sure you all are following the healthiest diet, but this is how this food, what it does is it causes the generation of free radicals that now you know how these free radicals are helping in triggering inflammation and further helping in the progression of cancer or with the generation of cancer. Now, this is uh, just a slide where I tried to bring together for your health, food carbing inflammation and food aggravating inflammation. So that once you have this in front of your eyes, you can easily make a quick decision what to get from the market. And of course, like organic is a much better choice. This particular slide carries like how to reduce the risk of recurrence. And I have tried to explain everything what came to my mind. And I would still say that taking care of yourself physically and emotionally is the most important factor. You know, be together. That is what I say. I know it really helps. Do what you love and always believe that there is a superpower who will help you, but you have to be positive. That emotional turmoil that we go through with every, in every phase of life, with different situations, with different diseases, don't let yourself down. The positivity helps. It will help to fight inflammation. It will help to fight 
everything in life, but you have to give your best rest. You know, it's, it's like whatever, we, never, we don't know what future lies in, but we have to give our best. Maintain a healthy weight, continue with regular health screenings. It's very important. I will give you a simple example again. We have in our support group, a stage four colon cancer um, advocate, and she's a survivor. And she heard from, I mean, when she stopped all her treatment, she got to know about the Ayurveda. So she went to India and she did the Ayurveda. She started to follow this Ayurveda regime with all everything like fit and proper. So when she came back here and when she went for her regular screening, her liver enzyme and she felt so good, but then her liver enzymes were significantly upregulated. So the doctors asked that, what did you do? I mean, to yourself, because everything was normal just before you left. Then she stopped the Ayurveda for one month. Everything came back to normal. So please judge yourself when you are taking anything in addition or anything new, which you are giving to your body. Ayurveda didn't work for her. Doesn't mean that it's not going to work for others. It will work for others probably once the treatment is over. But everyone's body is different. Everyone's body to react to the immune system, the immune response is different. How you take a new thing in your body. So judge yourself, do the screening regularly and very diligently. Check your vitamin D level because vitamin D has been seen to be related to many different um, you know, markers for inflammation and cancer. So keep, if you are in low in vitamin D, get your vitamin supplement, talk to your doctor. Improvement of your chronic diseases. If you have diabetes and you have cancer, make sure your diabetes is in control. Make sure that your other diseases are in control too. I know when we have cancer, we, over, we should not overlook our other diseases. Even a small infection also, we cannot overlook. In this situation of COVID-19, we have to be so careful because our immune system is suppressed. And then if we have any infection, it will be becoming more susceptible. But, and just to tell you this, uh, I'm in a doctor's forum for North Carolina. And um, the, I saw the doctors discussing that for the COVID-19, they were giving anti-IL-6, anti-inflammatory treatment which we give it for the immunotherapy, we do it for cancer patients. So they were trying it out when there was no other hope. So here also inflammation is playing a part. So here also like for the COVID also, they're trying to target inflammation. So that's where I say inflammation, it's so critical and it will regulate. So it doesn't show up as the primary, but on the secondary, on the, on the low level, it is causing so many crosstalks within our body. Load up your body with, uh, um, I mean, load, not load up on, load up with anti-inflammatory food to eliminate the, eliminate the inflammatory food from our body. Try to keep your sugar level down. So this will be definitely, if you try to uh, work on this uh, regime, it will really help. That, I mean, I cannot guarantee that it's going to take all the pain away, but it will definitely help. That I can definitely say definitely with exercise. It works like miracle, but moderate level exercise. If you're going through treatment, and also I want to just tell you one story here. My mentor in Mayo Clinic, Dr. Sandra Gandler, like I just love her like anything. You know, when uh, this was like in 2007, when I was, or 2006, when I was doing my postdoctoral fellow over there in Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Scottsdale. So Dr. Gandler was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, and she was BRCA positive too. I'm going to talk about it after a little bit. And BRCA1 that you all are familiar with, the genetic mutation. And what happened was she, um, she went for her uh, everything, to, I think surgery was done and then her chemo started. After the chemo, so we all knew that she was going through chemotherapy and uh, we were like in the lab, we were talking and we were like praying for her. Then suddenly we heard her voice. And when uh, I was like, whose voice is that? We went to her office and she was right there. So I was like, what are you doing here? You just had your uh, chemo done today. She said, so what? Because that helps me. That's the distraction. So, and that's the passion she has to work in this area. So take your passion and she's a survivor. She was diagnosed, I think BRCA positive stage three and it's been more than 10 years. Now she's 74 plus and uh, She's happy, she's doing everything she loves. 
and she was working equally and she just finished and she was at the, at, at the lab. So that's what it is, you know, distraction, passion, do what you love to do. Make passion your work and this will really help. Now, I want to, so all this time I was talking about different ways you can bring down inflammation, different ways inflammation is caused. And of course, like, as I said, five to 10% or 10 to 12% is the genetics. We can't do anything at that time, right? But like, and we all know that the two type of more or most prevalent mutations is BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So I want to ask you one thing. When we think of the genetic mutations with breast cancer, do we ever think like, for example, if, if your mom has breast cancer, if your aunt has breast cancer, grandma has breast cancer or ovarian cancer, we know we have to do the genetic testing for BRCA. Do we ever think of the men of the family? We always forget the men. They are equally the carriers for the BRCA mutation gene or any type of genes. And you see this picture, I have just, here's the affected father and the normal mom. And you see like the carrier or the affected son can be affected equally as daughter. So if you have in your family, you are positive for any particular type of mutation, please get your- you put your information on Please get your son, your, everyone tested. You know, this is the precautionary measure because the men are not only prone to breast cancer, they're also prone to prostate cancer, skin cancer, digestive tract cancer, pancreatic cancer, different types. So you have to, the way you are vigilant now, they also have to be equally vigilant and they also have to follow a strict principles life so that we don't give the, we don't give a scope for, to, we know that genetically we are mutated with these factors, but we also should take all the, try to take the precautionary measures to live with our lifestyle so that, you know, we are careful and we don't let the mutation get over us. You know? So this is something that I wanted to say. Now coming to that, I also wanted to mention, like as uh, Leslie said, equally like um, I want to do a lot more with the male breast cancer situation because when we were running the experiments in the lab, do you know that we always run the experiments with the females, with the female transgenic models? But do the female system is equal to the male system with the different hormones, with the different stuff? It's not. But still, even today, the male, when a male man is detected with breast cancer, they do not have much choice. They are given the same type of chemo, same type of treatment, like, you know, the targeted therapy as the females. And that's why I'm, we collaborated with Male Breast Cancer Coalition and I'm working with the MBCC brothers. And uh, if I see anyone detected with breast cancer in men, I try to navigate them towards them. And that's what I believe in. If someone is already working on it, why not connect them to them? so that they have a huge support group. And I share their stories everywhere because with men, the situation is more, I feel like, especially in the developing countries, we do not talk, women do not talk about issues with the breast because it's a huge taboo. And that's what I'm trying to break when I travel to the developing countries, they break the breast taboo and the ignorance is another factor. And when I talk, even in US, when I talk about male breast cancer, 70% of the probs in the session, 70% of the men are not aware that they can get breast cancer too. Like if you see here, this picture in the car, this is Marlene. We lost Marlene in 2017 in the month of May. Do you know Marlene was fighting for breast cancer for his daughter? And he had no idea, though he was an educator in the school, he was a principal, he didn't know that he can get breast cancer too. And he was diagnosed at stage four and within five months he passed away. And she is, Mar, um, Mar, of course, Marlene's wife, Patricia, a very good friend of mine. And she has Marlene's picture here on the car and she travels all across US so that men get to know that they can get breast cancer too. And I take, um, I take that story everywhere I travel, everywhere in the developing countries because it's an eye opener. And, uh, and um, two cases in India we diagnosed because in the session there were men and one man came up to me and said like, I can feel a lump and my sister died of breast cancer. Do you think I will have it? I said, of course. And he's alive, he's saved. But if we didn't 
generate the awareness or the knowledge, he would have not been today alive. So this small knowledge, I mean, we think like this is just an awareness information, but this will help save life. We ignore the man. We think like it's only one in, uh, I think it's now the frequency is one in 853, but one also matters to us. We save one life, we save a family. So we cannot ignore men. Equally, we have to emphasize on the situation with men. Now, what can men and women do? Now, I know Leslie mentioned yesterday that uh, I know we have to, even when we went through lumpectomy, when we went through mastectomy, the other breast, if we have done mastectomy, full mastectomy in double mastectomy, then we don't have to. But if we have done one breast mastectomy, then the other breast, we have to go for screening. And that's where I always feel that breast self-examination is one of the main factors because breast cancer is not only going to be um, going to be uh, affecting women of above 40. Like our situation is like I get my mammogram notice every year since I turned 40. I'm getting the message. But what if I develop breast cancer and because young women, young men are developing breast cancer from the age of I met a woman 22 year old. She is in our support group and then she's just 22 and she got diagnosed and she had no idea and she got diagnosed pretty late. So that is the reason why I feel like breast self-examination is one of the main uh, ways, you know, we can save ourselves and the right way to do it. And I'm going to share this. We have it in 17 languages now. Our BCH volunteers have, Breast Cancer Hub volunteers have translated them because we do not believe in Google Translator because there's a lot of mistakes. So we went every language we have a review committee and so that's how we develop this cars the the link will be there you can download the language of your choice and you can circulate in your network and we have it for both men and women because men need to check themselves everyone in your family need to check themselves from the age of 17 or 18. the reason why i say if you see here he's the founder um, brett is the founder of male breast cancer coalition he fell the lump at the age of 18. and if you see here um, sam raviera he fell the lump at the age of 17. that's why for men and women both from early age, we should do breast self examination. And definitely if you feel a lump, we have to go for the screening and we have to do a regular screening that we are, um, that is a mandatory and there is no alternative to that because that way we can detect ourselves early. Now, one important aspect here, I want to bring it to you all is, um, I'm sure you're aware of this with the issues with mammogram, the dense breast. Because when we go for, so I came, uh, my storyline, I made it like this, inflammation, ways to cut, bring down inflammation. And also we have to be very proactive with our screening procedure. Now, among that, we all know that mammogram is the gold standard. Now, last year, three times I went for mammogram. So I have dense breast. So I just want to explain what is dense breast. Now, our breast tissue, so mammogram is x-ray of the breast in simple term. Now, our breast tissue is made up of mostly fatty tissue. When it's fatty tissue, the mammogram appears as black. When we have dense breast, which is dense tissue, which is fibroglandular tissue, it appears like this as a white patch. If we have heterogeneous dense breast, it will be scattered like this. If we have homogeneous dense breast, like full dense, it will be all spread out like this. Why I'm talking about dense breast? Because when we have a tumor, it appears as a white dot like this. But if we have dense breast, it's like the tumor is it's like finding a snowflake in a snowstorm. And that's how even in US, so the reason why I started working on dense breast a lot because I'm a reviewer for DOD, Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Program. And then it was when I was with University of North Carolina, I would go for the study session. And I think among you, uh, many of you will be also reviewer because we need advocate reviewer also along with the scientist reviewer panel. So when I would go for the study section, to review the grants, I would meet the breast cancer advocates who would be at stage four. 
And then who would tell me that, some would tell me, Lopa, I did my mammogram religiously. My mammogram missed my tumor because of Jan's breast. And that affected me. I felt like this is not fair. And that's why even when I am going to India, over there, mammogram itself is a difficult scenario. And even when I'm talking here, everywhere I talk about this. So that be your own judge. When um, I think um, someone saw this session in US and she had a lump, did her mammogram, it came as negative because the mammogram was totally happy mammogram. She could feel the lump grow, went back to the doctor and said, do something else, do an, a 3D mammogram or do an ex extensive screening. And it came out as cancer. So you have to be proactive and I'm sure because of Dr. Nancy Capallo, you all, she passed away last year, but because of her, even many states in US, now we get the letter and she is the founder of RU Dance and she was my mentor for Breast Cancer Hub. That's why I know her so well. And, um, and, beca and because of her, we get the letter in North Carolina if we have dense breast or not. So if we have dense breast, just be careful. Like I have dense breast. Last year, they, they did my 3D mammogram three times. And I kept telling them, don't expose my breast. The breast tissues are very soft, you know? And we never know this exposure of radiation because mammogram is slow, uh, low dose radiation, right? And this can eventually lead to cancer too because breast tissues, are, I kept saying, but for some reason, I hope like, um, this will not create any like when it's out there on YouTube, but I'm very vocal about everything. What is true is true. What I faced, I faced, and I don't want others to face it. And I kept telling that. And when the doctor finally said, now you have to do an ultrasound. And I'm like, why didn't you do an ultrasound along with my mammogram when we know I have dense breast? Why did you expose my breast three times to the radiation, like back to back in two, in three weeks? Because that's not good. And then he said like, a lot of insurance, a lot of things come into play, right? So that is the main problem. So if you know, just talk to your doctor, do my ultrasound. When I travel to the developing countries, one good thing over there is a lot of time mammograms machine don't even work. And then people don't even have like the money to do mammogram, but ultrasound is a better, easier option too. So women just go for ultrasound. And I know with mammogram, a lot of structures become very clear because with ultrasound, we will never know if we have dense breast or not. But with mammogram, the structure is so clear. We get to know our type of tissue. But once we know it, knowledge is power. You become the advocate. You talk about it to your doctor, that what to do with your situation with the screening. Now that was all about like how we can do the screening. Now I want to switch a little bit because um, Leslie mentioned that I can talk about it, like how we are making the change and uh, the small steps like the cancer screening camps with Breast Cancer Hub. So what we do is we connect the developed and developing country. So, um, I, um, when, so when Leslie mentioned I had my grant from NCI, so when I was a PI with the NCI at University of North Carolina in 2017, at that point I resigned from my job because I felt that if I keep thinking about my career, I can never do this. And I knew that this would help to save lives. So everything I do is pro bono and, and voluntary now. So, but I think um, what I get is the satisfaction because in the developing countries, the issue, the major issue is late diagnosis because the concept of going for mammogram is not there. It's the culture-based inertia, it's the embarrassment and taboo, and that's what we are trying to break. And also the ignorance, like women don't even know that a lump, painless or painful lump can be cancer. And that's why, like, you know, when I'm going to the villages, I felt that if I go to the village and they are all daily wage earners. If I tell them go and spend like $1 also is a huge deal for them. So if you go and do the mammogram, it will never work. So that's why what you see here, they love the breast survey exam card in the local languages. So when I'm giving it out to them, they love it, they take it, and everyone has their my WhatsApp number. If they have any issue, they connect me because now everyone have their cell phone and the WhatsApp is free. They connect with me, and then if they diagnose a lump, I connect them to the local healthcare center, and I make sure that the treatment is done. And that's how we are trying to make the change in simple, small ways. 
Now with research, as Leslie said, with male breast cancer, we are definitely focusing a lot and also from the developing and underprivileged sectors, because my goal is the untapped areas we want to tap. The underprivileged sectors in Charlotte, that's where I'm working on a lot, like in a different places involving the students a lot because students are our future. I'm going and doing the sessions in the schools in the US and also making them the community leaders. So if any kids from Carolina Breast Health would like to be a, a conduct session within the network, they're most welcome. So I do the mentoring and I translate it because I feel like if they can give the information out, that's how like a ripple effect, all this information will be really helpful for people to know, which will help with the early detection and also reducing the progression of cancer. And um, we have adopted villages um, in India, now starting with India because that's, it becomes easier for me, but that's where I come from, but also plan in other places and um, going to every household and doing cancer screening now for um, oral, cervical and breast cancer. And this is a treatment bucket for the underprivileged and here, this is my favorite slide because our advocates are our pillars. And that's why I wanted to, for a long time, I, I don't know if, I didn't tell Leslie, but last year also I tried to connect with Carolina Breast Health because best friends, because I always had the, had the desire to come and meet everyone because I always felt that the stories, you know, you know how in India I could help to break the taboo because of this amazing women because they let me share their stories. A place where we don't even speak about breast and I'm going to those areas and talking about breast like anything, it's like my mom and dad used to tell me, like people will kidnap you and they will do something to you, you know, the way you are going. But this amazing women help because when they see someone else talking about their journey, the women feel the men, when they see men getting it, they're like, why can't we speak about it? So you are most welcome to, um, like, if you would like to share your stories, your journey, we have on our website, we have a section called heroes. Like they, I mean, advocates are our real hero and we publish their stories and it can be shared everywhere. So that, because I feel that survivors and uh, cancer advocates who are going through are the biggest source of inspiration for all of us. We do patient counseling, like, um, I just want to tell you, I don't know how much time I have. I have time. So I want to tell you this story. If you see here, you know, like I feel like US is so privileged through the thinking process. And I really respect that. So I went to this village here. This woman was, she is no more. She was diagnosed. Uh, she was diagnosed actually at stage three. She was getting free treatment, but she was so poor that she had to pay the fees for her son. And for her going to the market for daily wage earning was more important because no one told her that if she stopped her treatment, the cancer can come back. And now she is no more. But when I did her interview, it broke my heart because I wish someone had told her that your life is equally as important with your son's schooling. And when I went to see her, she was lying on the floor, just on the floor. Because when I asked her family that what happened, why is she on the floor? Why is she not even on the bamboo bed? You know what she said? Her family said, cancer is contagious. This is what we have in our mind. And I was shocked. That's why I tell everyone that, you know, viral infection, so many other infections are contagious, but with cancer, it's not. And you, cancer patients, they need hugs. They don't, they cannot, they, it, this is like, un, uh, I mean, I cannot take this. So this is where the small changes and I have been extensively doing this for the last two and a half years. And you cannot believe like how many people the mindset have changed now. And um, this is what actually we are trying to do. And uh, we capture the real time interview and everyone, anyone who would need any help, support, I'm always there for you. And we have BCH ambassadors, also BCH initiatives like uh, WINGS. So any other cancer, if you know of anyone who need help, you can connect to us. And everything we do is free and it's, um, it's for the community. So there is no like, um, there's no other reason why, it's just that we want to help. And that's why I'm trying to do that. Now, who we are, 
We are a global network. We connect the developed and developing countries. We definitely fight breast cancer in women as well as men. And also we support all other type of cancer. Because when we think about other type of cancer, we inflammation, when I'm talking about inflammation, it's not restricted to breast cancer alone. You know, the, all the mechanism that happens in our body, the underlying mechanism for cancer is the same, whether be it originates in breast or pancreas or other places. So when we are trying to control inflammation or other uh, things in our body, we are actually working to control other type of cancer too, to come and be affected in our body. And that's why I always believe that, you know, working with breast cancer is our primary goal, but we are always here to support all other type of cancer too. And we are also a hub of resources. So um, what I, so if you go to Breast Cancer Hub Global Network, you will see that I believe in bringing information about all other organizations. For example, Male Breast Cancer Coalition, we have a full page about their story, whatever they give us, we publish. Because I want to connect everyone. You know, a lot of people ask me like, how do you differentiate? And one thing I say, like, why do we have to differentiate? Can't we work together? Because we are working for the cause of cancer. And if we come together, definitely we can be a stronger team, share the knowledge and empower each other. And that's our goal. And I hope that, you know, like um, you, in, um, I could give something to you today to, uh, you know, walk out with. And uh, with that, I would like to end today's talk. But um, I'm always here to answer your questions. And I'm extremely great. I'm grateful to Leslie for being so nice, so encouraging. And uh, I know you had to cancel the February because I was in India for my dad. And but he was so adjustable all the time. And thank you, Carolina Breast Friends. And thank you, Pink House for giving me the opportunity and um, to be in front of you. Thank you. And uh, any questions, I'm here to answer for sure. And this is my information and Leslie will share it with everyone if you ever need to connect to me. Thank you. Lopa, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And your slides were beautiful. And your information was everything we needed to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? And uh, I just, uh, so probably I have to go out from the share screen to see the questions. Or... And I can read the questions to you whenever you're ready. Okay. So maybe I will just, uh, let me see the chat room. Okay. Uh, probably I'll just stop share and then I can, oh, no. Okay, I don't see the question when I'm actually, uh, okay, you can read the question to me, Leslie. Yeah. Okay, the first question is from Connie Beals. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Her question is, can you use turmeric while taking tamoxifen? If not, what is an alternative? You can use turmeric when you're taking tamoxifen. And are you taking tamoxifen for the five year duration or 10 year? Um, Connie, you may, you may need to unmute yourself, Connie, if you're still on the line. I am on the line. I'm, I have taken tamoxifen for six years. I'm on the 10 year regiment. Okay. Okay. So yes, Connie, you can definitely take, but I would not recommend you to take any, like, I'm not in favor of any capsules. Like if you would like, you can go to any store and you can get fresh turmeric, you know, from the market and use it like, you know, like in any of your juice or anything like, a, or in the curry, like if you are making any, um, uh, I know in Indian spice, we use turmeric all the time, but, um, but definitely like you can use it fresh or you can use it in the curry. Like just add the turmeric at the end and you can boil it with something. So you can definitely have turmeric. That's really a good anti-inflammatory and with no side effects and um, no bad, uh, in, definitely you can take it. Okay, the next question is from Christy Lee. And she said she has read about nightshades, which are tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And she's read that they can be pro-inflammatory for some people. Do you recommend an elimination diet to determine if that is the case for each person? 
Yes, I would definitely. So it's your own body. You are the judge. Like the same way I said, I have like mutations for blood clotting. So I don't take any green in the diet. The green I know is rich in antioxidant. So make your own judgment. So tomatoes, potato, I mean the sweet potato, people say is rich in antioxidant, pepper rich in capsin. Eggplant, I'm not sure of because eggplant, a lot of people are sensitive. You know, because a lot of people get um, immunological reaction or rashes, and sometimes they also develop it afterwards. Like I know someone who was taking um, eggplant all throughout the life, but then suddenly um, she or he tried with the GMO certified because nowadays, you know, all these genetically modified vegetables, that is what is causing more complications, I feel. Because genetically modified, when the, she started to have the eggplant, she started to get the rashes, which is inflammation, which is not good at all. So make your own judgment, you know? So if you think like your body is not liking it, don't take it. So, but this in general is very good rich in antioxidants, yeah. Okay, thank you. The next question is from, from Ann Gupta. What about dairy, legumes, soy, gluten, and grains. Some people say they can cause inflammation. Yes, and uh, I received this question so many times, like about dairy. Dairy is a big, <laughs> is a big uh, topic now, you know. So Annie, thank you for the wonderful question, and thank you all for the beautiful questions. Actually, these are uh, very tricky questions, I would say. So. Um, Dairy, I would say that um, any animal product, I'm not that much in favor of because for me, example, in my case, I can't eat dairy because I'm lactose intolerant. So when I have dairy, I get a lot of like, you know, bowel indigestion and all of that. So if my body can't take it, but other than that, if I'm having oat milk, if I'm having, uh, I think uh, some other type of milk, which is um, not coming from the, not dairy, non-dairy milk, then my body is still okay. It can adjust. So, but with research, there are a lot of complications coming up. There are a lot of pros and cons, actually. Some say that there is a link between dairy and cancer. Some say like it's still like undiagnosed. It's not reported clearly. So I would say that let's wait for some time with the dairy. What actually is the link? Because I don't want to tell you something that I am myself not still confident. But if your body doesn't like dairy, if you're having a lot of bowel issues and all, don't take it. Take what your body wants. Legumes, I have noticed that these are rich in protein, right? And um, if like a lot of people are gluten allergic, so they are, they, their body do not take gluten. Legume, I have not seen anyone, any new research coming up saying any, you know, with the link between legumes, uh, lentils and uh, cancer. So I'm not sure because a lot of people are having legumes, vegetarian diet. It's a good vegetarian diet for protein substitute. And I have seen a lot of people with this diet living for years with no, I mean, I mean, they, they, they have lived like 90, 70, 80. And with, I mean, diseases can happen. I can't guarantee, but I have not seen still any connection between legume and cancer. But coming to gluten, yes, gluten causes inflammation. And if your body is not liking gluten, definitely you can avoid it. Because I know people who are gluten sensitive and when they eliminated gluten from their diet, they really lived a healthy life. But I would, eliminating gluten is not easy. Everything is with gluten. Like rice is gluten free, I know, but it's not easy to go about with gluten free all the time. So if your body is taking it, have it, but in a minimal amount. Like whole wheat is good compared to the processed white, uh, you know, like processed flour. So avoid the processed ones, rather go to the whole wheat. But then if you are having gluten allergy, then or any reaction, don't take it. So you make your decision because there'll be hundreds of articles. There'll be so many WhatsApp messages and I just don't um, make your own decision because somewhere in the WhatsApp message, I saw that turmeric can cure cancer. It, and they stopped and in India and other places. They were believing it. They were stopping the other treatment. But just tell me if turmeric would cure cancer, then no Indians would have cancer because we are having turmeric in our diet since like day one because all our curry is made up of turmeric. Right. So, but it helps with in you know, with the. I mean, as an anti-inflammatory diet, turmeric is helpful. So that's why I say make your own decision. I hope I'm able to answer you, Annie, and everyone. Okay. 
Thank you, Lupa. The next question is, do you have any research data about the role of the vagus nerve tone in controlling inflammation? I don't have any um, research data yet. So I have to look it up. And if you share your email address, I can look it up and I'll get back to you for sure about it. Yes. Okay. And the next question is from Connie Beals. How can you determine... How can you, sorry, how can you? How can you determine your inflammation level? Oh, inflammation level. So sometimes like I have a slide here, I wanted to, um, so it's the redness, but whatever is external, we can easily determine, right? It's like the sore, the redness and everything. But sometimes I feel like whatever I have read from different uh, articles is that if you are starting to feel low, you know, with your mood, with your low, with your energy level, then if you are not feeling with your digestive tract system also, if you are feeling something like uncomfortable, if you're having like, uh, if you're not feeling okay, but sometimes inflammation can go on and on without any symptoms also. So we really can't capture inflammation until unless the symptoms are really promising and upcoming, but at the low level inflammation is very difficult to catch until unless it's on the external side. But I would definitely say that keep your resume lifestyle strong so that you don't let the low level, low grade inflammation to overcome your, your immune system. But also another very important way I feel is getting infection easily. Because you know, inflammation will help with, uh, will, what will they do is they'll weaken the immune system too. And you may fall into a lot of like, um, like inflammatory like infections. Even a common cold may take time for you to uh, get healed quickly. Like I have two sons and my oldest son, I kind of know that uh, he falls sick very quickly. And uh, that's why I try to make him, uh, because, because I think, um, like it's not nothing external internally himself his immune system is always been on the weaker side so what i do is that you know i try to keep his diet very healthy make him exercise do all that so that i know that even if he's getting infection he's cured in the same pace as his brother so mm -hmm. that way like you know those are the small ways that we can think of but uh, of how we understand that if we are having an inflammatory condition but pain is one of the ways too like if you are any internal organ is paining, it's like a swelling, you can understand inside there be a cramp. These are different. And the last question is, can you hear me because my lights just, just flickered. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I yes. Hear okay. You. Okay, good. I was afraid I was losing power. What about C-reactive protein test? Doesn't that tell you inflammation amount? It definitely does. If you want to do tests, then there are definitely many inflammatory markers. So that definitely you can do. I was thinking of more like how you can feel the inflammation in your body. But definitely there are many pro-inflammatory markers like IL-6, IL-17, and uh, you know, so many different reactive proteins, which if you would like to go and test with the doctor, you can definitely do that. But um, for me, most important is getting any type of disease, like chronic inflammatory disease, that we definitely have to target. So that is the primary situation. But a lot of tests are available, so which if you would like to, you can definitely go and check it, yeah. Great, does anybody else have any questions? You can unmute yourself rather than type it in if, if you've got a question um, before we let Dr. Dasroy go. Anybody else? This has been amazing. Your information has been so helpful and we appreciate it so much. Well, thank you so much.